are many challenges to glycosylation analysis. Uh, mass spectrometry is a very powerful technique, but in the first instance, it will only give you composition. Sugars have monosaccharide sequence and linkage information, which is really important for the recognition functions of sugars. So if all you know is the mass spec composition, it actually doesn't give you enough information to be able to draw the molecule. So you have to bring in more powerful technologies like um, MSMS, uh, fragmentation mass spec technologies, and when you use these, you very often lose the quantifiable aspect of glycan analysis, which is also really important for function. So uh, people use LC coupled to mass spectrometry. The LC data are quantitative because we use a stoichiometric label which can uh, be detected by fluorescence detectors. And then the sample online goes into the mass spectrometry, so we have the best of both worlds. We also have a set of exoglycosidase enzymes, which are used in arrays to sequentially cleave back monosaccharides in particular linkages. So every structure that we publish has three pieces of orthogonal information. The elution position on uh, the LC, the mass spec composition, the mass spec fragmentation if we need it, and also the exoglycosidase enzyme arrays. That will really give you everything. If you have a more simple system, then you can choose from that array of tools to find something that answers your particular question. So whether we've cracked the code for turning glycans into biomarkers, I think we're very confident that the glycans offer a, a, a really strong set of biomarkers and they're complementary to other markers. So our aim is to obtain biomarkers from every omics technology that we can for one patient so that we have a range of markers uh, and we also can begin to see the pathway that the disease is taking in that patient. So certainly glycan markers are in many cases better than the existing clinical markers. Uh, we still have a problem because most of the path labs that you talk to want to have ELISAs and glycan analysis is not well done by ELISAs. So it's a reason why we've developed our own platform technology so that we can translate our findings into a clinical setting and, and enable multiple samples to be done in a very short space of time. Uh, am I um, an alchemist? <laughs> is another question you asked. Um, actually, I have a a regard for many of the genuine alchemists. I think they were the early chemists. They did actually discover a lot of things that were valuable and when they weren't doing hokey pokey actually they... Um, the, the thing I respect about them is that they realised that science was not just a technical matter, it was also a question of a whole life um, dedication. So they would have musical instruments in their laboratories, they would have prejures so they could pray or meditate. Um, I think today we think science is uh, very technical and we sometimes forget you know, the creative aspects that precede the technical applications that we develop. Am I a successful mother? Well, you have to ask my kids whether I'm a successful mother. Um, I think I'm very fortunate in my children and they're extremely supportive and um, it, in turn I think that's important, I have 10 grandchildren now, and it's very important for their wives, I think, that my sons are used to seeing a mother who's got a career and who has a passion of her own, and so I think their wives have no problem in having passions and wanting to work or not work as they choose, uh, and my sons, are, it's a good experience for them to have grown up with a mother who's sole interest is not in the home, you know. I can talk more about glycomics being planted in the clinics. Uh, I hope it's not far away. Uh, we've built a very comprehensive workflow with waters. It's all been commercialised, it's all GMP compliant. So the fundamental, everything is, the, the data analysis is all done uh, in a data compliant way. Um, and so I, I hope the platform, it will be improved, I'm sure, but there is basically a platform there already which we could take to the regulators to, uh, to, to enable glycomarkers to be licensed for use in the clinics. I think it, the really biggest problem is the 
a ch a changing the mindset of the companies that do uh, uh, that run path, path labs because they would have to have a, a new technology which they're not accustomed to using. Most of them have very little space, they're under a huge amount of pressure and actually bringing in new technology is pretty difficult. So in my opinion we need um, specialised companies, small companies to set up and use these markers and then maybe uh, once they're seen to be successful they can be, uh, be sold to the bigger uh, um, biomarker analysts because we have got some really nice biomarkers for example being able to distinguish uh, MODI type diabetes from people who have type 1 and type 2 and at the moment this is poorly diagnosed and in fact the treatment regimes are completely different so if you're misdiagnosed you can be given the wrong treatment so that's a very simple um, example of a, of a glycan marker that actually is, is very useful in the clinics. So I think there's a whole range available now from release glycans to glycopeptides. Well, the major problems in mass based proteomics are its interpretation of data, I would say. It, it's not difficult to get lots of peaks, but to understand what's in them and which ones are significant and to get sufficient signal to lois and to be able to get quantitation, which makes them clinically useful. I think there's still problems that are waiting to be solved. Every technique for analytics has the same associated difficulties. It's, um, in mass spec you see everything, where if you use the LC with labelled glycans, you only see labelled glycans. So it, it's easier because you're not trying to um, eliminate artefacts from your profile in the way you are with mass spectrometry. Um, I think mass spectrometry, it's in its simplicity in a, in a Maldi situation, anybody can operate Maldi, but as soon as you get into these bigger instruments, they become much more expensive and then you begin to need experts to run them. So there, you know, there, there are associated problems with mass spectrometry, but there are associated problems with every analytical technology. When people say to me how complicated glycosylation is, I often say, well, tell me what one single copy of your protein looks like. And they say, well, 60% is phosphorylated, 20% uh, has uh, methionine oxidation, 10% uh, has cysteine um, bond scrambling, or uh, some of it has uh, C-terminal lysine clipping. And I say, no, 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 just one single copy. What does it look like? And of course they don't know because you don't know whether phosphorylation is always at the same sites if you have C-terminal lysine clipping, for example, or you know you, you don't know the combinations of those different PTMs. And there are 200 PTMs on post-translational modifications on proteins. So actually knowing what a single protein like is like is very difficult, and it's difficult in glycoscience as well. But I think it's really important because biology doesn't see averages. Biology sees a single molecule when it's interacting with a receptor. So how we deal with that level of, of subdividing groups of proteins into ones that are active because they have a certain combination of post translational modifications or, or glycoforms which have certain combinations of glycans which are functionally important. Um, I think it's important to be able to do that. I mean, some modifications to proteins will take a protein from the nuclear, uh, from the nuclear, a uh, nuclear capsid out into the cytosol, right? Uh, it's not all of that protein goes, just the ones that have a particular modification. And the same with glycans. It's not every copy of the protein that performs a function. It's just that subset that have a particular glycan structure that enables it, that copy of the protein to interact with a receptor. I think the peer review system is difficult just because there are so many papers being published and I would say that too many papers are published because um, people's careers depend on publications in a way that they never did before. There's some of the really great scientists, I remember Rodney Porter in Oxford who got the Nobel Prize, they, they were published five or six papers a year and now even ordinary PIs are, paying, are, are publishing 20 or 30 and it's just too many for the peer review system to cope with because I can't handle reviewing 30 papers a year and yet I'm expecting somebody to review mine. Uh, so I think there are pressures, a lot of pressures, but I don't really think that publishing without peer review is a very good idea because 
the literature just gets too many erroneous and poorly written papers. And I know from our experience that a good reviewer will raise the level of the paper very significantly. So I, I really think that system is the best. But somehow we have to persuade people it's better to publish one big paper than four or five small papers. Um, and maybe we've got too many journals as well. I think it's come a long way. I remember speaking at the very first Hupo meeting. I think the technology has advanced enormously and maybe, you know, the, the, now we don't do so many 2D gels, which had a lot of problems of their own. Uh, we have um, much better databases for, um, for proteins and, and particularly peptides. I think the Hupo meeting is making enormous efforts to uh, to expand their areas of interest so they're not just in a silo and I think that's really important because if proteomics can't talk to uh, genomics and can't talk to glycomics it's really uh, it's a, you're really only seeing one small segment of the of the, the problem so the more proteomics reaches out because it's in a very pivotal position like the genes of themselves do very little the proteins are really the, the workhorses of organisms and the sugars are important fine tuners so they're, and they're also lipidomics, metabolomics, other omics as well. So I think the, um, the, the HUPO, it's very important that they recognise the pivotal position they're in and actually reach out to all these other groups and try, try, uh, I mean as Joe Biden said the other night, you know, to try to uh, put software in place so that we can share data and then the bioinformaticians can use their skills to make links between the different um, data sets that are there and and then you know one day we may have something close to personalized medicine but we're far from that at the moment.